Hi, everybody. This is God Sad. I wanted to wish everyone a happy Trans Visibility Day. I wanted to remind people, oh, look what I got. Look what I got. I am transphobic because when I got married, I chose a woman based on her genitalia status when I now know that women could have or nine inch. This is the way that you do the work. It has to be a costly signal. Uh, I wrote earlier today that uh, I'm hoping that when Yom Kippur comes around, the, the holiest uh, day in the Jewish calendar, that uh, noble Joe Biden and uh, prophet, uh, the grand uh, Ayatollah Justin Trudeau, will declare Yom Kippur to be transgender uh, of color visibility day. Have a good day, everybody. Do the work. Cheers. That, of course, was the great Gad Sad. I'm the pretty decent Dave Rubin. This is the Rubin Report. It's April 1st, 2024. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. It's April Fool's Day. And I was like, all right, what can I tell the people? What can we do to play with them for just a moment? But how much more do you want than Gad Sad as a trans woman self-flagellating? I mean, how much more do you really want? I can't give you much more than that, uh, but I can tell you that we are live streaming on Rumble, we're live streaming on YouTube and on Locals, post-game show, as always, rubenreport.locals.com, and I hope everybody had a great Easter weekend, uh, and actually, that's really what we're going to be focusing on, because Easter weekend turns in turned into Trans Visibility Day yesterday, which was just absolutely bananas, and yes, it was by design, and so the theme of the show today is that my... My theory about what's happening in the world is actually becoming true. Uh, you know, what we've seen, I think, largely since October 7th is that the left has just absolutely moved on the Jews, the Saturday people. And I think now they're making the move to the Sunday people, the Christians. And I think an awful lot of people are seeing that uh, when the president of the United States declares Easter Sunday Trans Visibility Day and when several high ranking people in the government post longer videos and longer tweets and more emotive stuff about Trans Visibility Day, which is a totally made up day, uh, than they do about uh, Easter, which is a fairly important day for millions and millions of people across the world, regardless of whether you're a Christian or not. That is the thing. So I think that this is just once again illustrated the shift we are seeing right now. And the question is, of course, will any of this change electorally when we get to that election that we have in November. So uh, let's start with a clip from uh, Real Time with Bill Maher on Friday night because he had former U.S. Secretary of Defense Mark Esper on. Uh, and first we're going to talk about the woke military and then we'll connect that uh, to this trans day of visibility. Uh, and Bill asked uh, Mark, uh, again, former U.S. Secretary of Defense Esper, Mark Esper, uh, he asked him, like, how woke is the military and is this something we have to worry about? Take a look. Well, what are the specifics that they're talking about when they say a woke military yeah. is threatening our readiness? What are they talking about specifically? What kind of things? And is there any credibility to that? Second question first. Let me say it's, it's not as bad as the right would say, but it's, it's worse than what the left will acknowledge. And what does it look like? That's uh, everything in America. You're right. <laughs> uh, You know, this, this administration set up a DEI office that would, would, would dictate DOD policies for education. There are classes on what to say and what not, what not to say. For example, you shouldn't say, hey, guys. You should say, hey, everyone. In the military? In the military. You shouldn't say uh, mom and dad. You should say parents and guardians, right? Uh, the colorblind argument. There's the issue of, you know, drag queen story hours on post. Now, look, I don't think this is driven from the, the leadership at the Pentagon. I think it's coming from the White House and from people within the administration who come in and believe that they're pushing their agenda forward. And look, you asked what's, what's the problem. The problem is 
it, it, it takes time and resources away from the troops that they should otherwise be training and preparing for war. And it further divides us. It further starts putting people into buckets, whether you're based on your ethnicity, your gender, your sex, the color of your skin. And my view is, I'm sorry, you're in the military. If you're in the Army, you're all green. Right. right? If you're in the Air Force, you're all blue. We have a common mission, a common purpose. Let's stop subdividing and identifying people along those lines because it creates friction that undermines morale and readiness. I salute that. That is quite an excellent explanation of why DEI destroys everything, right? So I've talked about this many times over the years, uh, but my friend Peter Bogosian, who's been on the show, he will have him back in the studio in a couple of weeks. Uh, years ago, he was talking about this. When DEI was first getting put into all of these big institutions, his Pete's argument, basically, Pete, who is a, a liberal atheist, his argument was once you start bringing diversity, equity, and inclusion into any organization, you now are taking your eye off the ball. So if you are, if you're just, if you have a restaurant and you insert DEI, you're not necessarily focused on serving the best food or making or doing the best by your customers. You're focused on the skin color of your sous chef or whatever else. You're taking the eye off the ball. And that's what Vesper is saying there. You're taking time and resources away from whatever the mission is saying, uh, say, I don't know, being prepared to go to war or defend the country. Maybe that's what they should be focused on. Uh, and also that it further divides us. It starts making us all actually racist, right? We're always warned about systemic racism, uh, but then they are the ones that want a certain amount of black people doing this and a certain amount of white people doing this. And of course, if you want a certain amount of this color person doing this, you're gonna have to punish a certain amount of this people. Like we all get that. And, and what was interesting to me, of course, there is that Bill, who again, I like, uh, that this surprises him to some extent. Now, I also want to say that Vesper had a great line at the top, which he said, it's not as bad as the right would say, but it's worse than the left will acknowledge. Now, that may be a lot of things in America right now, and it's hard to gauge how bad things really are and how uh, how overstated some things might be, but we we know something is not right in all of our institutions. And as he also said, it's being driven, it's agenda driven by the White House. And the question is, for all you liberals out there, once again, this is Dave repeating himself, if you stand against the woke stuff, if you don't like systemic racism, if you are against all of this, then how can you possibly vote for Democrats? And then, of course, now let's connect this to yesterday, which was Easter Sunday. Uh, here we have a tweet from Owen Schroyer, which explains what happened here. This is a screenshot from whitehouse.gov. And Owen wrote, the Biden White House has released a statement proclaiming that tomorrow, Easter Sunday, is now Transgender uh, Visibility Day. I'll just read the first portion there. Now, therefore, I, Joseph R. Biden, Jr., President of the United States of America, by virtue of the authority vested in me by the Constitution and the laws of the United States, do hereby proclaim that March 31st, 2124, as Trans day of visibility. I'll go a little further. I call upon all Americans to join us in lifting up the lives and voices of transgender people throughout our nation and work towards eliminating violence and discrimination based on gender identity. Now, it should be noted, there was a lot of confusion about this and people were fighting about this all day yesterday, which is a damn shame because actually it was Easter Sunday, which is a fairly holy day. Uh, there was a lot of confusion as to whether the Biden administration purposely set this up for the first time yesterday, knowing it was Easter. Now, actually, that is not the case. Transgender Visibility Day was set to be March 31st by the Obama administration some years ago. Now, the, the, the little fly in the ointment here is that they knew that eventually in the next couple of years, this was going to fall on Easter Sunday. So I think this is another one of those things where this, you could, all roads lead back to Obama, right? But even putting that aside for a moment, that it was always March Trans Visibility Day, regardless of whether you think we should have one or not, it was always March 31st. They knew it was gonna fall on Easter, okay, fine. But now the real issue is the, the administration's focus on that instead of Easter, right? Uh, we have a tweet 
from end wokeness here. Uh, Biden declared Easter Sunday to be trans visibility day because apparently they're invisible the rest of the year. And I think you see the point there. They've taken over the corporations and they've taken over the trains and they've taken over the White House and there are flags everywhere. We know we're all being bludgeoned with this complete nonsense. And now check this out. This is Education Secretary Cardona uh, who got rid of his American flag pin and put up an LGBTQI2 spirit. What else can we throw in there? You like puppy masks? transgender day of visibility pin and he had this to say to the many transgender students across the country listening on this trans day of visibility we in the biden harris administration want you to know that we see you we support you and we celebrate you we also know it's not an easy time to be you walking into a classroom should be an act of hope not an act of bravery but every day you choose to show up as your true self you make this world a more brave, more honest, and more free place. In your gift for seeing things as they could be, I see the promise of America. Today, we at the Department of Education want you to know that your school, your community, and your country are better because you're a part of it. You don't just belong here. We need you here. From all of us here at the Department of Education, happy Trans Day of Visibility. Yeah, it was also Easter. He forgot to say that. Um, okay, first off, uh, for any of you that have read Abigail Schreier's book, Irreversible Damage, we know there's a huge social contagion element to it. And then when you see the head of the Department of Sec uh, Education telling kids like, oh, you're great because of this, it encourages more kids to do it. These kids don't know what they're doing. Their brains aren't fully developed yet. Their bodies aren't fully developed yet. They're, they are literally, as Jordan Peterson calls them, they are butchering these children, chopping off their genitals, injecting them with all of this medication. We now know that the detransition movement is picking up steam. But the real issue here is, okay, so fine. They did it on Easter, which is kind of disgusting. And that was set up by Obama intentionally. There's just no doubt about it. He knew this would happen along the way or who, whoever's working with him on this kind of stuff. But why is it that the government is so into the trans thing? Let's say you are a 20 something year old adult and you wish to dress the other way and be called another name and everything else and you are a functional member of society and a decent person and everything else. As I've said a million times, I would treat that person with respect. I've met a few of those people over the years, okay? Um, that would be one thing, but this push on children, that's what the video was about, the children, and you will lead us to a better future and all of this stuff. It's evil, and you know it's evil because it's being pushed not only by this administration, but by the crazy clown communist country of California. And here's Gavin Newsom on trans visibility. Today on Trans Day of Visibility, we celebrate the trans individuals in our communities and recognize their struggle, struggles for recognition and increasingly survival in the face of unfathomable hate, hate which leads them to often feel unsafe or like they don't belong. And we also celebrate the many contributions that they've made. We've had trans leaders at the forefront of progress in every field imaginable, from STEM to the arts, to human rights advocacy, to so much more. All across the country, we're, we're seeing a rise, a rise in legal, political, and physical attacks on those in the trans community. And it's just appalling and unconscionable, this discrimination, and it's gone on for far too long. Look, at the end of the day, everyone wants and deserves to be respected, connected, and protected. Our trans community deserves no less. So Jen and I wanted to add our voices uh, and our support to the millions of people celebrating today. For those of you in the trans community, whether you are out or not, we value you and we appreciate you. He might be trans, he, well, trans, I would say transhuman is a thing when humans start in, you know, switching out body parts with robots, but he's not human. He, he is not human. He's trans devil. I, I don't know what that is. It's just so deeply inauthentic. Uh, and that they want trans people to be protected. This is a man who wants the government to pay for 14 year olds to chop their genitals off. But you have to give the devil his due. Note how they do it, that they're the good guys. They're protecting people. They don't want people to be hated or anything else. Do you think the people, the average person right now, and, and when we talk about trans, it's 0 0.001. Like think about the amount of energy that is being focused on this trans thing all the time. But do you think that the people who are pushing against it, right? The people who just bring up the point like, oh, maybe kids aren't ready to think this stuff through and maybe there is a social contagion and you're born a certain way and maybe you should 
respect that because even if you have all of the operations and all of the drugs and all of the mutilation, that when you get out on the other side, you might not look exactly how you want to look and actually your parts might not work properly and you maybe will never be able to have a proper sexual relationship, which might lead to an inability to have a proper emotional relationship with somebody else and all of those things. Do you think those are the haters? Those are the haters right now? But it continues. This is the entire Democrat Party, right? We just showed you what Joe Biden put out there on, on Easter Sunday. Then, then there's the Secretary of Education. Then there's the lunatic in California. And then here's what happened in New York. This is a tweet from Colin Rugg. New York Governor Kathy Hochul has ordered that New York landmarks be lit up in transgender flag colors on Easter Sunday. Hochul issued a proclamation declaring March 31st, 2024, Transgender Day of Visibility. The landmarks that will now be lit up include Niagara Falls, One World Trade Center, Empire State Plaza, Kozakuku Bridge, the State Education Building, and more. Governor Kathy Hochul today issued a proclamation declaring March 31st, 2024, Transgender Day of Visibility, celebrating the trans community in New York State and across the country. The governor also announced that New York State landmarks will be lit pink, white, and light blue tomorrow, March 31st, in celebration of Transgender Day of Visibility. So they, we again, they just push this on us. And the question has to be why? Why are they endlessly pushing this on us? Well, you know, I also mentioned at the top of the show that I've been saying and thinking, and I'm not the only one saying and or thinking it for the last few months, especially since October 7th, that they come for the Saturday people first, the Jews, and then they move on the Christians. And it's it's clearly open season on Jews at college campuses, and it's the way this administration is treating Israel, and all of that. You guys get all of that. Well, now it is full on moving to the Christians. This. It's not as if there was no warning against this, say, during the Christmas tree lighting in Rockefeller Center when the pro-Hamas people were rallying there. Well, then yesterday, pro-Hamas, and yes, they are pro-Hamas, they are not pro-Palestinian, radicals interrupted Easter services at St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York City. This is the most famous cathedral in all of the United States of America on basically their holiest day. Well, it is their holy. I would... Easter technically would be more holy than, than even Christmas, right? I think, yeah. Uh, on their holiest day, here are pro-Hamas protesters interrupting the service. Now, you might watch that and say, okay, that's only a handful of protesters. But the point is, that, well, first off, we know this is happening everywhere with bridge blockings and all of the other nonsense that they're doing. But they want to destroy absolutely everything. And that is what they are doing. They are making everything political all the time, which is why you would have Trans Visibility Day on the holiest day for Christians in the calendar. And you would, and then you combine, it's like you combine this trans thing with this Palestinian thing. By the way, Jesus of Nazareth, who lived in Bethlehem, all in the ancient land of Israel, was a Jew. I know that's very upsetting to the pro-Hamas crowd. But now I want to juxtapose what happened there at the St. Patrick's Cathedral uh, with 95 years ago yesterday. This is, that's right. Uh, this is March 31st, 1929. Uh, this is New York City on Easter. Look, I'm, I, you know, I love those videos. I just love playing those videos, and I know they can feel a little heavy-handed at times because, of course, not everything was great 95 years ago. 
but there was a decorum, there was a decency, there was a feeling of sanity in that place. And it was a place of, of growth in the best sense where people could build their lives and their businesses and their families and all of those things. Uh, just show you one more. So this is from the N Wokeness account on Twitter. This is New York City, 1950s versus 2020s. And I think it illustrates the point quite well. Again, it does not mean that everything was perfect for everybody in the 1950s, okay? I understand there's a separation between church and state, all of those things, but something is being intentionally attacked right now by this administration, which is why they want to cut the genitals off children. Okay, fine, all the other nonsense, but at the very least, they've now gone full blown, let's chop the genitals off children and make a big deal about it on Easter. And guess what? It is pissing off a whole bunch of people. We'll get to that in a moment, but check this out too. Google yesterday on Easter Sunday, that's what they did, absolutely nothing for uh, Easter Sunday, which is strange because of course on uh, Black Month, what do they call it? Black Pride Month, what is it? Black History Month, you're gonna get Harriet Tubman, of course, so just nothing for Easter. And of course, we could have shown you 80,000 gay rainbow nonsensical things that Google is always doing. So again, it's the government, it's tech, you see it. You see it, and we're gonna show you some of the response to it in just a second. Let me talk to you guys about Preserve Gold. Guys, you know, so a new central bank digital currency is coming and could replace your dollars with digital currency. With it could come surveillance of our lives, freezing of our assets, and government control over our bank accounts and how we spend our money. Americans who wanna protect their liberty and privacy need to prepare themselves for what's to come. That's why many Americans are turning to physical gold and silver to diversify their wealth. If you wanna help protect your retirement, I recommend you request your free investment guide from my friends at Preserve Gold today. They'll explore the right options for you and will help you with the process to have physical gold and silver delivered right to your door or inside your IRA, 401k, or other qualified retirement account. And they make it easy. They're a triple B accredited with zero consumer complaints and hundreds of satisfied clients. They're also a founding member of the Precious Metals Association, so you know you're in good hands. And as an exclusive offer for the Rubin Report viewers, they'll give you up to $10,000 in free gold and silver with a qualifying purchase or retirement account rollover. They'll even throw in an immediate 500 account credit if you request your investor guide today. So don't wait. Visit preservegold.com slash Dave today to get your free gold and silver investment guide and take the first step towards helping protect your wealth. Again, that's preservegold.com slash Dave to get your free guide from the good people at Preserve Gold. And now back to me. So the reaction to Trans Day of Visibility on Easter Sunday was exactly what you would expect. Uh, Patrick Beck David, my buddy up in Fort Lauderdale, uh, he did, he was celebrating Easter, but he took a moment to uh, put this out. And this is why as of last year, I stopped praying for tolerance because of the things that's taken place by Christians. Being way too tolerant with the behavior that's taken place from the White House, leadership at the top announcing that on Easter Sunday, tomorrow, for many of you that will be going to church to celebrate, you know what you're celebrating, resurrection, the White House chose to celebrate transgenders. The 0.1% of America, transgenders, who in many cases are going through challenges both mentally and emotionally, but we're wanting to celebrate the 0.1%, not the Christian nation, not the Christian leaders who have done incredible things for this country and the level of disgrace that this brings to us as a country, to the rest of the world, that our president wrote this and announced this yesterday for Sunday is a spit in the face to many Christians around the nation and you, you shouldn't be okay with this and you ought to stand up for yourself and realize that this is not acceptable. It's time for Christians to stop being so tolerant with this type of behavior. By the way, this isn't a left, right, center thing. This is if you're a Christian and your life, God, comes before your political party, you ought to stand up. If your political party comes before your faith, don't do anything about it. You decide what you value more, how you vote or how you pray. If we get those orders right, the future looks bright. But if we stop fearing God and no longer wanting the favor of God, the future doesn't look as bright as we... You know, he's hitting on a couple things here. First off, you all know the, the paradox of tolerance, right? Karl Popper's paradox of tolerance, that you want to be tolerant, but if you are in... If you are tolerant of intolerance, then eventually that intolerance will eat you. That is something that the left has done really well. That is what the woke did to the liberals. The liberals were all tolerant. 
and tolerance is good until a point. And the liberals could not figure out what that point was. Thus, now the Democrat Party has burst forth in all of this insanity. But he's also saying something else very deep there, which is that, that God and government are not, are not equal. They are not equal. We have God-given rights. That's what the founders intended. Now, you may be, you may be an atheist or purely secular or anything else. You, so if you don't want to call them God-given, they're innately human, whatever it might be. But the point is the government did not give us these rights. Meaning if the government fell tomorrow, if the, if the United States federal government fell tomorrow, you don't lose your rights, right? The government is set up to protect your rights, protect your God-given right to free speech, protect your God-given right to bear arms and protect your family. So we are getting to this weird point where they are attacking absolutely everything. They've attacked our ability uh, to just be in a city and be free because they don't, def they don't, they won't prosecute crimes properly, right? You can go in and steal whatever you want. We can have drug addicts here. We don't protect the border. All of the things that we know. And now they are in essence coming for what they really want to come for, which in some ways, it's, I don't know how to put it another way. In some ways it's God, right? Like if they can come for something that is connected to all of us, and they can destroy that thing, we will have nothing left to stand upon. I wanna show you uh, a tweet that I thought was quite good because uh, obviously Christians were outraged yesterday, but Erin Wexler, who I had on the Friday show, uh, I think two weeks ago, uh, she put this up, it was quite good. Uh, we are a society founded on a covenant with God and each other. Judaism understands this on a deep level. The name in Hebrew assigned to the United States does not literally translate to United States. It's Artsot Habrit, the land of covenant. When Americans turn their backs on the, this founding bond, society collapses. So it is no coincidence that we are increasingly a country of spiritually bankrupt cities and purposeless people. Our national spark is dimmed, but not extinguished. We are the land of covenant and we can find our way back. And she wrote an article about that for, uh, for the blaze. Uh, the point here is, again, there is a reason that Jews are kind of on their heels at the moment and buying a lot of guns and quite worried and that the institutions have all turned on Jews. And now we're seeing the beginnings of it with Christians. So I agree with you, PBD, Christians, which largely now also put that, that premium on tolerance. You gotta figure out what you're gonna be tolerant of. And are you gonna allow for Hamas marches and everything else to take over the Christmas lighting tr uh, ceremony in Rockefeller Center and then walk into St. Patrick's Cathedral and create religious strife and, and all of the criminality that we're just seeing everywhere? Or are you gonna do something about it? I, I don't know what the answer to that question is. Uh, I could use a little Relaxium right now, which is our sponsor, Hot Diggity Dog. Attention to all of you who are sleep deprived. If you stay in sleep debt and you want a solution to your sleepless nights and hard to get through days, look no further than Relaxium Sleep, America's number one most trusted sleep aid. Clinical, clinical neurologist, Dr. Eric Filibridi formulated this innovative drug-free blend of natural ingredients, including the exclusive Valorist blend that relaxes both the mind and body for a peaceful night's sleep. Medical experts tell us chronic sleep deprivation has severe consequences in impacting cognitive function, mood, and overall health. Adequate and consistent sleep is crucial for optimal well-being and daily functioning. Seriously, guys, if you're struggling with sleep, then you owe it to yourself to try Relaxium sleep risk-free like the tens of thousands of Americans that no longer suffer and are now falling asleep faster, staying asleep longer, and waking up refreshed every day. And the best part for you is that Relaxium sleep is offering a full-size bottle to try risk-free for 30 nights plus free shipping at less than a dollar a night. That's saving you over 60%. Love it or your money back guarantee. Click the link below or visit Relaxium dot com slash Ruben and now back to me. Okay, so let's uh, continue with sort of this this theme of religion and government and the muddling and the choosing of which way you want to go, people. Uh, this is a tweet from page six. Reverend Al Sharpton held a jailhouse baptism for Mayor Eric Adams on Good Friday. At first I thought Eric Adams got arrested, which I was very excited about, but apparently not. Okay, so that's that's just fine. Eric Adams, the mayor of New York City, who has largely destroyed New York City, I guess he's finding his faith again, and that actually is quite good relative to everything we're talking about on the show today. But of course, Eric Adams actually, even if he's being baptized again, does consider himself and government above God. And if you criticize him for ruining everything, well, Eric Adams 
will tell you that it's because you're racist. Mm-hmm. When you go, when you go uh, to these Hercs and you're seeing these young people, and I walk in and I talk with them, some of them come from West Africa, South America, Central America. All they're saying is, man, we, we just want to work. We don't want to sit around here all day and not do anything. That is why the real focus should be on our national government that's saying, why are you doing this to New York? Why you Check out what they're doing. They're doing it to New York. They're doing it to Chicago. They're doing it to Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. They're doing it to Houston. What is the same in all those cities? All black mayors. Mm. All black mayors. And so what we're saying, same thing that I'm going through here, my brother Johnson is going through. My sister Bass is going through. My brother Turner is going through. So our folks, are, what they wanted to happen, Governor Abbott wanted to happen, we're going to turn these of, of cities against their mayors. We're going to create this environment where they're all going to go against mm. their mayors. Go Google what they're doing to my brother in Chicago. Go Google what they're doing to Sister Bass. So the cities have now turned against these black mayors that are making real change for the first time. Right, over black and they, people. And, and, and they're using this to say, okay, these black mayors are not competent. They can't run their cities. They're mm. getting everything to the migrants and asylum seekers. This was a perfectly executed plan that we are buying into. To make black mayors look bad across exactly. the country. Mm. And when, we, when we're doing just the opposite. Where's the clown? So I can punch the clown. Uh, the kids were playing. I had the kids playing. We blew up the inflatable clown. I told you guys every now and again when I don't really want to analyze something, I'm just going to punch an inflatable clown. We brought it outside with the kids. Maybe somebody could get the clown. I'll punch it at the end of the show. Um, it, it's just incredible. His argument, the argument that what, first off, first off, it's the Democrat administration over the last three years that has let 7 million people into this country. So you want to be pissed at somebody first, you'd be pissed at Joe Biden, right? That would be number one, Eric Adams. Number two, when you're talking about Karen Bass in LA and you're talking about Brandon Johnson in Chicago and Houston, et cetera, et cetera, you guys are all sanctuary cities. You came in saying we are sanctuaries for illegals to come here. Now illegals get there and they're causing violence and drug use and there it, it's an endless suck on the system the taxpayer is getting less because you have you're you're distributing that money elsewhere to these illegals and people are turning on you because they're seeing the results of all that and you think it's because basically Ron DeSantis and Greg Abbott the uh, the governors from red states who are sending people to your sanctuary cities you think it's cuz they're racist no they're doing exactly what you guys said you guys said you're sanctuary cities and states, we are not here in Florida. Texas is not. Okay, you could call us racist if you want, but nobody is screwing you over with these people that you said you wanted because they're racist. Ugh. The other thing, of course, that Eric Adams is doing is he's not only welcoming these people and then saying that it's his that it's not his fault that they're causing a problem, he's also just giving them care. How do debit cards for migrants compare to New mm. York City welfare benefits? I like that. That's a good question because that was one of the biggest myths. And I think the Daily News just did a piece today of saying why this makes sense. So here's what happened. We were paying people, because we, by law we got to feed them three meals a day. We got to feed the migrants um, three meals a day. When I told the team we spent, we got to bring down the cost of this by 30% because it was costing us too much money, $12 billion over three years, $4 billion already. One of the places was food. We were seeing that we were having a 10% food waste. People were getting food that they didn't didn't want and they discarded. So my team came together, first deputy mayor, Sheena Wright, first black woman to be a first deputy mayor. She she came up with a team called Mochify, an MWBE, black product. They said that we can give people food cards where they can only purchase food and baby supplies. You will save uh, $600,000 a month in course, people would buy the food that they want and not giving it to them from someone from some large conglomerate. Then they will ha- have to spend the cards in the bodegas, the supermarkets, the local stores, so the money stays inside the com- community and, and the program is run by a person of, a person of color. We're saving seven mil- over $7 million a year. We have b- no more food waste because people are buying what they want. It's a black-owned company, so we put money back into a black businesses, like I said I, I, I was going, going to do. And you cannot buy anything but food or baby supplies. It's a complete win. Look, I get his suits fit well, but he is a racist and an idiot. 
um, his obsession with, okay, the black own this and the deputy is black and Bob, okay, who cares? Does any of this stuff work? What law, by the way? He says, the law says we have to feed these people three meals a day. Now, I'd, I'll accept that notion that there is a law in New York that says that, uh, but we also have federal immigration law that is being flouted sending you these people. So guess what? You could just deport them. You could just say, sorry, uh, we know we let you in. We're you know, and even give them, a, you could give them a, uh, what do you, what did kids give at birthdays? You give them not a parting gift, like it's a game show. What do you get? A goodie bag. You get a goodie bag. We'll give you a little something on your way out. A parting gift. You'll get a, and you'll get the Price is Right Home Edition. Like you're going to get something. You get it? But you can't, what, there's a law that says we got to give them. And, and it's just a, you can see what the government is. It's a giant grift. It's a giant, well, we'll get this guy to spend the money here. We'll give this guy the money. Awful, absolutely awful. But these people have been pushing these bad ideas forever. And how do they how do they push these bad ideas? Well, the corporate media puts people on television who are race grifters. Al Sharpton would be one of them over at the televised mental institution. But I wouldn't say he's the top race grifter over at MSNBC. That, of course, is Joy Reid. Uh, this video was going around over the weekend. Joy Reid seems to have some sort ha, had some sort of psychological break. If someone can make some sense of this, please let me know. I believe that the music, just to be totally clear here, because that's uh, you know I do the best I can. I believe the music was edited in by the wizards of the internet. But you just watch this and pray, pray, pray. Y'all think we don't know what you mean when you say DEI? We know what you mean. We know what you mean. <laughs> we know what you mean. So I think what she thinks we mean when we say DEI is that we are racist, but we're actually not racist because we would like to remove all systemic barriers and not discriminate against, discriminate against, say, an Asian kid who's working really hard when he's trying to get into Harvard, right? That's what we all mean. We want that thing that Martin Luther King Jr. wanted, right? Uh, it's not what they mean, but, but also she just comes off as a complete freaking lunatic. But you can see what's happening because they're losing the narrative on DEI. And we know now it's being pushed out of some schools and it's really been exposed uh, for what it is. Uh, they're now going to try to frame this around if you are against DEI, you basically uh, are like the most hardcore white supremacist around. So here is video of Baltimore Mayor Brandon Scott. And he is very upset. Oh, talking to Joy Reid, of course, and basically explaining that uh, if you if you go after him, you're pretty much saying the N-word. Allow you, uh, Mayor Scott, if you choose to do so, to respond to the tomfoolery uh, and attacks on you for having the nerve to be black and also a mayor. Well, I think, listen, uh, uh, I know and we all know and you know very well that black men and young black men in particular have been the boogeyman for those who are racist and think that only uh, uh, straight, wealthy white men should have a saying anything. We've been the boogeyman from them since the first day they brought us to this country. And what they mean by DI, in my opinion, is duly elected incumbent. Uh, we know what they want to say, uh, but they don't have the courage to say the N-word. And the fact that I don't uh, believe in their uh, untruthful and wrong ideology, and I am very proud of, proud of my heritage and who I am and where I come from, scares them. Uh, because me being at my position means that their way of thinking, their way of life of being comfortable and suffering and while everyone else suffers is going to be at risk. And they should be afraid because that's my purpose in life. Wow. It's his purpose in life to make white people afraid. I mean, basically, that's what he said. If you live in Baltimore, you should leave. You should leave, not because he is a young black man who is proud of his heritage, because he's destroying Baltimore. And yeah, we've got stats to back it up. According to the Baltimore Police Department, the city experienced about 37,000 reported crimes over the past year. Given the city's population size, the Baltimore crime rate is about 64.2 crimes per 1,000 residents. That's about three times the state and national average. Baltimore is the third most dangerously violent city in America and one of the most dangerous cities in the world. Now, he would say by me reading those statistics about crime in his city that I'm racist, but I would prefer that there would be less crime except progressive policies that he believes in and that Brandon Johnson in Chicago believes in and that 
Eric Adams in New York believes in, they lead to more crime, more mayhem, and, and more and more people fleeing those cities. And then they allow all the illegals in. That is not racist to say, but you really, if, you, if you're watching this and you live in Baltimore, you gotta go because it isn't going to be saved. I don't know, the question always with all of these things is what is rock bottom? What is rock bottom? I don't know what rock bottom is, but it's a damn shame because uh, they've, they've basically created a situation where that race is now all they've got. And, they, and also I think there's something else going on here, which is that they now see that culturally Donald Trump is picking up steam with some black people and they really, really don't want that to happen. They need that black vote that they never do anything for black people. They keep them in this position, never do anything for them, but they need that vote. So here is former head of the Republican National Party, Michael Steele. He is now a pet Republican over on MSNBC. So he goes on MSNBC to pretend he's a Republican, to bash Republicans all the time. Here he is on with Joy Reid, uh, arguing that if Trump's reelected, uh, they're gonna be shooting people and we're gonna bust out the concentration camps. And so when he's back in that office, you need to understand what a man says he wants to be a dictator, what that means for your freedoms. So yeah, you can you can disagree with Joe Biden on Gaza. You can be pissed because you didn't get he didn't get the uh, you know this or that uh, policy through, but you'll be able to gather in Lafayette Square at Radio City Music Hall in 2025, 26, 27, and protest that. That is not a guarantee from the man who says he wants to be a dictator, and you need to really process that and get over you know, what, whatever's ailing you right now, because I'm telling you, I'd rather be able to protest mm -hmm. under Joe Biden than to be worried about someone knocking on my door and pulling me out of my house or arresting me because I am protesting a policy under Donald Trump. Or, 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 or being shot, which is what Donald Trump loves to say. It's one of his favorite phrases. He said he would like people who are doing protests like the one outside of this building Creating to be shot. Creating concentration camps in, in, or putting in Texas. Camps. Yeah. That's what he yeah. said. And you, when somebody tells you who they are, you should believe in the first time. Yes, we believe who you are, Joy. Uh, but you can see what they're doing, right? They're escalating everything. Donald Trump was president once. And by the way, when, when we had the summer of love under Donald Trump, he didn't send in the National Guard anywhere. He let the states deal with things. A lot of people wanted him to do more to stop the violence that was happening across America, and he didn't do it. So he has a track record, actually, of allowing for protests and cities to be burned down. You might not like that. Um, but you see, they have to escalate this now because none of the policies are working. So like, if you live in Chicago or New York or LA or any of these places, you're the average person, you're going, boy, this, this whole place is collapsing. So the mayors of these cities have to basically say you're racist. And then they also have to tell you that if we don't get the president that we want, Joe Biden, who, but they don't even really love Joe Biden, but if we don't get that guy again, we're gonna end up shooting people in the streets and they're gonna be building concentration camps. Here's another host on the televised mental institution known as MSNBC, Nicole Wallace, having, a, having an emotional breakdown because Donald Trump criticized a New York judge's daughter. So, you know, <laughs> it's time to do something different. Like, we're not gonna have this conversation again. I have come on the air with breaking news about requests for gag orders because of threats for judges and their kids more times than I could count today before I got ready. And Judge Ludig, I think it's time, I don't know who has to write the banners at the bottom of my show, I'm sorry in advance, but Donald Trump broke the rule of law. And we should cover a broken judiciary in this country. Donald Trump managed to delay every federal criminal trial based on facts that he barely denies. Donald Trump managed to enlist the Supreme Court in a delay process, the highest court in the land. I actually don't know what she's talking about. But there, I did it too. Okay, oh, oh. horrible paper cut over there, sorry. Uh, the point of all of this is that they are going to ramp it up. They're gonna ramp up the craziness so that more and more people, you know what's gonna happen. Like they're, they're, you look at all the polls, Trump's winning in all the polls now, and enough people are waking up to the woke nonsense. People have had this trans day of visibility, like America turning on Israel, like all of this stuff, people are waking up to it, the, the Bidenomics, all of it. More people are turning to Trump, so they have to ramp up the concentration camps. He's gonna shoot people. He's a white supremacist and everything else. But okay, let's say, let's say you don't like Joe. If you're watching the show, my guess is you don't like Joe Biden. 
And if you're watching the show, you probably mostly like Donald Trump, but you're not, maybe some of you are not quite there or whatever else. Well, there is another choice also, and I wanna pay some attention uh, for a moment to Robert F. Kennedy. He's actually gonna be here in studio on Wednesday. We've got some info here uh, on the Daily Wire because he did make some news uh, over the last couple of days. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. announced on Tuesday that he has selected Nicole Shanahan to be his vice presidential running mate as he continues to run as an independent after dropping out of the Democrat Party's presidential primary late last year. Shanahan, the ex-wife of Google, C, uh, Google co-founder Sergey Brin, has a history of donating to Democrat politicians and is the president and founder of an organization that invests in leftist criminal justice policy, environmentalism, abortion access, and more. Okay, so a lot of people, and I will ask RFK when he's sitting right there, two feet from where I am right now, I will ask him this on Wednesday, what was going on here? Now, why did he choose her? Because he's not a bananas lefty. She seems to be, let's say, more on the woke side, and especially the criminal justice stuff. It's like, what are you doing? Now, I think the real answer to that is that she's got a crazy amount of money, right? So it can help him move he, has to, he needs money to stay in at this point. Um, but it strikes me as a big loss for, for Robert F. Kennedy Jr. And again, I will talk to him about it. Uh, but in a weird way, I think you could also frame it that it's a, it's a win for him because it's pissing off the liberals now, right? So it's a loss in that you're picking someone who's kind of far left, so now you might pull some votes from Trump. You're also pissing off the Democrats because you're going, uh-oh, they're going, uh-oh, he's gonna take some votes from Biden because he went further left. Allow me to illustrate this perfectly. Here is Whoopi and Joy Behar over on The View, and they are trying to figure out why RFK would do this. Didn't he just um, choose a he just billionaire a silicon, vice president yeah. who can now help him get on the ba ballots in, in, in different states and battleground states? Well, here's yeah. the thing. That's, that's it's, pretty smart. It's one, well, yeah, it's one more bad message yeah. for folks that says you can buy the election. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mark. Somebody has to ask him, why are you doing this? Why do you want to destroy the election and, and hand it to Trump if possible? Yeah, but it, I mean, he, he, take he's a this. Kennedy. His, his forefathers are rolling over in their graves with this. His own family is telling him. But a lot know. of people... It, and we already have one clown in the race. Do we need two of them? But a lot of... I think many times delusion has destroyed a country. And that's what we're dealing with here well, with this. But, the, the polls are too close. Okay, so just to illustrate the point in case I didn't make it clear before, what's interesting here is RFK, we don't know who he's gonna pull more from, right? So if you're like crazy on COVID and you're pissed about COVID and you're on the right, like you're pissed at Trump about that, so we know that RFK is gonna get some support there. Now by him choosing this woman who is more of a far lefty, he's going to be pissing off uh, some of the regular Democrats, right? Because he's gonna get some of the crazy lefties. So now the question is, where does he get more from and who does he take more from? Clearly, the ladies at The View are afraid he's now going to take more away from Biden. So again, I will discuss this uh, with him on Wednesday. But wh what is the real takeaway of today's show? It's like, how do, we, how do we beat this thing that is happening right now? Trans Visibility Day on Easter, political leaders like Joe Biden and Eric Adams and, and uh Pundits like Joy Reid, these people who racialize everything and who are blowing out every same thing that we had in America. Well, here I can give RFK some credit. Maybe there are some old ideas that we should turn back to. And I thought for the day after Easter, we could do a little bit of that to end the show. So here's RFK uh, sharing one of his favorite Bible verses. I remember when I got out of the rehab, I read a a line from Isaiah that said, be still and know that I am God. And that had a huge impact on me of learning to be still is so much because my life before was including drugs. It's about, you know, feeling discomfort and then having to fix it somehow. And, you know, growing up is about learning to live with this discomfort and just experience it like dark clouds on the horizon that it's gonna come through and that you just have to experience it and let it keep flowing and there's nothing to do about it, you know? And, and learning that, learning to be still, learning to be indifferent to pain, learning to be indifferent to pleasure, to desire, you know, those should be ultimately the ambition of, a, of an enlightened, you know, of a spiritual enlightenment.
Okay, so perhaps we need a little bit more of that, not being so reactionary, not freaking out all the time. It's one of the things when I show you these clips of MSNBC and they're trying to make everybody see those dark clouds all the time. And unless you give them the power over your life and vote the way you they want you to vote, then the, then the worst possible thing is going to happen. Like maybe that's not exactly what's going on here. Uh, but now I wanna show you another clip. We got, we got three clips to finish this up. So that was RFK on, on be still for a moment. Bad things are gonna happen. Like have some relationship with God, let's say, that's gonna help like steady the ship throughout that. Uh, and here's Russell Brand on uh, why you should, let's say, uh, think about God a little bit, because uh, perhaps we all end up thinking about something one way or another. When it says in the Old Testament, worship no other gods than me, the implication I offer is that we are a species that worships. And if you do not access the divine, you will worship the mundial. You will worship the profane. You will worship your own identity. You will worship your belongings. You will worship the template lane before you by a culture that wants you, well, wants you, but gets you distracted. Huh, if you don't worship the transcendent, if you don't worship God, let's say, you will worship your own identity. Does that sound a little bit like what might be going on here? Uh, and now I wanna show you one that I, I saw this over the weekend and I just thought it was absolutely spectacular. Of course, it's Jordan Peterson. In, in terms of how you can be truthful when you are actually worshiping God or, or well, just watch. I don't need to explain Jordan. Do not use God's name in vain. And people think that means don't swear. And it kind of means that in some trivial way. But mostly what it means is do not claim divine motivation for self-serving behavior. And that's what all the protesters are doing. We're so compassionate in public. It's like, no, I don't think so. I think you're narcissistic psychopaths, fundamentally. And if you're not, well, at that moment, you're certainly possessed by that spirit. Look at how good we are. That's why Christ says in the Gospels not to let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. If you're going to be good, do it in secret. Why? So you don't, so you don't fall prey to the temptation to make your good subordinate to your pride. Right? That's what the bloody Oedipal mothers do all the time. Yeah. Look how much I love my son. Yeah. He doesn't even have a penis anymore. We solved yeah, that well. problem for him. Wow. Yeah, wow. It's so bloody. It's so brutal. It's so dark. It's it's virtually unimaginable. It's such a pit. It's so awful. And then the mother can parade around with what what has she got her son's genitals on a stick <laughs> so, so she can parade down the street. Oh, absolutely. And show her neighbors. Look how compassionate I am. No matter what he turns into, I still love him. Brutal. Would you say that or would it be something more along the lines of he n is so loving and so compassionate for having been at my breast that he has essentially voluntarily discarded oh, these toxic. Oh, that'd be her name. That'd be her cover story. <laughs> and, you know, the other part of that secret desire is, well, immense hatred for men. Immense, immense hatred for men. For, for, or for what? that particular breed of woman thinks men stand for and are, so, you know. Okay, so to conclude today's show, I'm not here to tell you what to believe or how to believe or what religion you should believe in or anything else. I think the broader point is that you better believe in something right now that is not the government because the government is deeply corrupt, right? Like there, there is a war on everything sane. 20 years ago, if you would have thought that we'd be having Trans Visibility Day on Easter Sunday, everyone, atheist, Jew, Christian, everyone would have said this is completely insane, right? So we better return to something that is roughly sane and it doesn't mean we're all gonna live perfect lives and we're all sinners and all of those things. But you gotta figure out what you believe because it seems to me a war is here. We are actually in an existential war right now. There is, there is a, little, a literal war happening in the Middle East. And I think you could argue there is a literal war happening in our country with borders and everything else. But there is an existential war that until we get our heads straight, we, there, we just have simply no chance to survive. Uh, all right, people, that is our program for today, this April 1st, 2024. Uh, my full episode with Winston Marshall is up across platforms right now. Uh, people of the internet will be live at 1 p.m. Ta-ta. 
Everyone knows that New York City is the Athens of America. It's the Istanbul of America. It's the keys of America. It's the soul of America. We are the Tel Aviv of America. New York City is the Islamabad of America. The Zagreb of America. We are the Lima of America. New York City is Mes Mexico City of America. This is the Dublin of America, New York City.